we kind of extended it to the weekend as well. So we had some campus events and today we have our uh, this Science Cafe with uh, Dr. Geeti Tuvedi and the format of our Science Cafe is very informal. You can you be yourself please and everybody here is, is equal. Uh, we want to have conversations and dialogues. This is not a monologue, it's not a lecture. So please, please be at ease and and just enjoy yourself. from our flight facility at this. So thank you, Mahin and Pavitra. Um, I am Deepthi Trivedi. I work at Bangalore Life Science Cluster. Um, and today I'm going to talk about small fruit flies, which I call Isohana Milagocasters. You will know why they are called supermodels um, during my talk. And as Mahin said, please feel free to ask any question and interrupt anytime you want. So what do I do? I, I'll start from there. So I uh, run a facility, um, which is a Drosophila facility, where we generate all these um, mutants and um, different kinds of uh, Drosophila flies. So we have collection of thousands of these fruit flies. And so you must wonder that why should we maintain so many fruit flies and why should we keep so many fruit flies? They are not even interesting. They are constantly bugging us all the time. Uh, on our fruits and they are a nuisance in, in, in our kitchens. And the other thing is that why should, um, I mean everybody should wonder that why should taxpayers money should go into these kinds of research and why should government spend so much of money on researching on fruit flies which are not even, I mean it's not human research or you know something that can be of any use. So it almost looks like a hobby but a boring hobby as such because um, all these hobbies that we actually end up doing at home like collection of large collections of stamps or match boxes or something like that it's at least interesting it's colorful if, if you want to collect live specimen why not collect butterflies which, are, which have such beautiful body pattern um, fruit flies have been extremely important for the amount of knowledge we have about our cells first of all and uh, secondly we would have come to the same conclusions anyway using other modern organisms but it would have been much much more expensive and much much more uh, time consuming as compared to what we know now. So the first two characters of our story are these two gentlemen. Does anybody know them? Mendel. Ha. So the first one is Mendel and the second one Charles is Charles Darwin. So uh, these two people are the first part of our story. They are not heroes of our, of our story because those will come later. Charles Darwin and Gregor Mendel both were uh, contemporaries. They were uh, they were working in late 19th century. And Charles Darwin was a naturalist. So what he did was he was traveling around the world, looking at different specimens and recording them. It's, it was the last one. No, they did not work on flies and we have, we have not come to flies yet, okay? So, um, so Darwin was actually looking at different birds and finches and tortoise and all different animals in different parts of the world and he came up with some very bizarre uh, hypothesis or theory which said that all of us have come from the same origins. What it means is that imagine if you have a time machine. So if you went back in time, you you see your parents as young kids, as young as you are, and then you will see your grandparents as that young kids, and then you go back and back and back. And what he said was that if we went enough back, our ancestors and ancestors of let's say chimpanzees or um, or mice or fishes or frogs or even flies. And even if you can keep going further and further and further back and you keep looking at your ancestors, we have common ancestors with even plants and fungus and even bacteria. So that's what he said, that if you went back and back in time, you will have the same kind of this. You, have, you share your ancestors with different organisms and what by implication what it would mean is that if you went further ahead in future, in the same time machine, you will see that in million years, you will not see humans or you will not see any of these organisms that we know now, but you will see completely different kinds of organisms and that's what we call as evolution. That you are evolving constantly and every organism that you see today has evolved to this extent. So that was what Darwin said. And now coming back to Mendel. Mendel was the kind of person who was very quiet. He was a monk. 
He used to stay in this monastery in what is uh, present day Czech Republic. And he had these acres and acres of land. And there he was growing uh, peas. So he was, he had different kinds of peas, peas that were round, peas that were rough, peas that grew tall, peas that grew short, peas that had different kinds of flowers, all different kinds of things. And then he was crossing them with each other and finding out what kind of berries they make. So if you take a round, a round pea and a rough pea, what will be their progeny? And he was counting them and he, he did this meticulous thousands of plants and thousands of seeds and everything and he came up with some hypothesis which, which we now know as Mendel's laws of genetics but at that time his nobody knew him he died completely not known to anybody he did publish his work but Darwin did not know about his work anyway although Mendel seemed to have known Darwin's work but Darwin's work was so bizarre that it divided but, but it was sensational so everybody talked about it they were either thinking that ah, he's just blabbering something and there's nothing of any significance what he's saying and some people were thinking that he's, he has come up with such a great hypothesis. So now we come to our uh, protagonist as they say or hero of the story and who is uh, Morgan. He was a scientist at Columbia University and he was a real experimental biologist. So all these theories and all these things, you can't go to these random islands, look at the birds and decide that how they have evolved. If there is evolution, if it is correct, then you should be able to do it. You should be able to see it experimentally in front of your eyes. Whatever I don't see in front of my eyes, I don't believe it. So it was a true experimental biologist. So how do you do that? If you take two humans, like your parents and then you have you, you as a child and would you wait for yourself to become adult and have your children? It is a long process. You can't do it with humans. So what do you do? You have to find an organism or any animal that grows fast. Correct. Great. So it has to grow fast and also it should be easy to grow. You don't want to work on a marine organism at Antarctica where you have to go to Antarctica, find this animal and just start working there. You can't do that. You have to find something that uh, that should be very easy to grow, easy to grow in your lab, right? And then it would be better that it should be cheap to grow. And he had this thought that uh, if I keep some organism, which and also it should have a different kind of characters. You can't work on, let's say, yeast or bacteria. But at that time, it was not easy to do it anyway. But you know, but they don't have any characters which you can classify or something. You need to have something which you are aware that it should have eyes, legs, body. You know, you can see that evolution is happening. So how how different it looks after it has evolved. So after much deliberation and talking to different people and so on, he um, came to uh, and he talked to several people and he came to um, this organism, which is a fruit fly. Okay, so these fruit flies are very tiny. You must have seen them all of you in your kitchen. Yeah. So um, these fruit flies were then. Um, he chose them because they had a very short life cycle. When you have a fly and it gives rise to a baby, it grows within 10 days and then in one month, how many generations if one, one fly comes in 10 days? How many? Four generations. Well, you start with one fly on 1st of March, yeah, yesterday, and then in 10 days, it becomes, I mean, when you start with the end, it becomes an adult on 10 days. And then in 12, 13 days, it again gives an egg, which within 10 more days gives again an adult. And so you have these, from first egg to the 30th, you have these four generation or fourth generation coming or three generation. Um, and so you have this thing where you can very rapidly, within months or within years, go through several generations. So he thought that I will keep these flies with me and keep growing them and keep growing them and keep growing them and then see if I see any difference in these flies because if there is a difference that means evolution has happened. And within a few days he sees that although all his flies are red eyed, there is one fly that is in that box that's white eyed and he got really really excited about it. 
apparently there, there are these stories, I don't know how true they are, that he was carrying these flies everywhere in his bag and his pocket because he was so excited about it and he didn't know why this is white eyed but he was very excited and apparently he had a baby and he went to the hospital and he was, went to the hospital with this fly with him, with him and before he could ask his wife, how is the baby? The wife asked, how's your fly? So it was like really exciting time for him. So what he did was he took this fly, he crossed it or mated it with different kinds of, so this little, it was a male fly. So it mated it with different females and came up with some very interesting data. So before we uh, go what he found, I want to show you his lab, which has been recreated recently. Uh, and, and currently the fly labs don't look like this, but this is very exciting because, you know, they were collecting it on bananas. So there were bananas in, the, in their uh, lab. And in the half pint milk bottles, they were keeping these flies. And over, I mean, over some time, he did find more than just white eyed fly. He found vermilion eyed fly, he found curly winged fly, he found several, like maybe 50 to 100 different kinds of uh, characters which were different from the white eyed fly. And so, this one, see, all of them are being grown in bananas, which we don't do anymore. Um, and this particular fly, if you look closely, it is white eye and it has slight blur in the brain, some of them. See, this is this one. And these are the red eye flies, which are being grown uh, together. So what he did was he had these separate different kinds of um, what we call as phenotypes or characters, and, what, and, and then he was drawing them because there was no way of photographing these kind of things. Uh, that what was the difference between these flies and during this process what he was able to achieve is that he was able to show that on the chromosomes which are the one which are the uh, where our uh, these characters reside on something like a chain kind of structure which are called the chromosomes and each of these characters were linearly arranged on the chromosome. How he was able to do that was just by simple genetics, by just mating two flies with different characters and in their progeny or in their babies looking at how often these characters came in different in different concentrations. So here, for example, they are just they have this simple microscope. Um, so how to make these flies sleep? Currently we use carbon dioxide, but they were using um, ether um, just to make them sleep, and you will see that how these separating the flies in the microscope with a brush and then maybe counting them okay so yes, this is the fly and different character flies were separated out then you count them and these are the kind of maps that they built that on the chromosome where exactly each of these characters reside and we now know them as genes but at that time people did not Call them as genes, but that was that was the the major contribution which made the so this was like modern genetics was coming together in this lab at that time. So what did they achieve in the process? As I just said, that they came to know well that there is a linear something chromosome. I mean, there are a lot of things which I will say now, which basically are uh, not the not the terminology from that time. Just because we know it now, um, so we have this chromosome, and on each on this chromosome we have these different characters which we now know, know as genes, and they are linearly arranged. So what it also means is that if this character and this character they are close to each other, they will always remain together in us, or the, the frequency of them remaining together is very high. What does that mean? Sometimes you see that you have two characters that is coming always from your mother and they are always together just because they are genetically close to each other in the chromosome. So what I mean is that each, so we are made up of cells, right? We are all made of different kinds of cells. We have hair cells, we have eye cells. Eye also has like 15 different kinds of cell types. 
we have skin cells, we have heart cells. All the smallest living unit that is within us is a cell. Okay? And each of the cell is a nucleus. And in the nucleus is where these genetic material lie. Okay? So in the nucleus are these chromosomes which are threads of material. Okay? And this thread of material has these characters, different characters arranged on them. Okay? So how your eye should look like, how your hair should look like, what color should your skin be, your, what color your hair should be, what color or, or character, how, how, uh, how tall you will be, how short you would be, all these characters are decided by those blue circles that are there. Those are the characters that are present in your cell. Okay? And some of the characters always go together and some characters don't have to go together. And the, the characters which don't go together, they can come only half the time. Half the time from your mother, half the time from your father, like that. But the characters which are close to each other always stay together. Okay. So, yeah. You say characters, are you talking about the A, G, C, D or? I'm talking about genes now, like the big unit, gene. So, and so what is the gene character? So what I'm talking, so I'm the word, the reason why I'm using the word character is, is just a phenotype. Phenotypes are just the visible things. So for example, blue eye is a phenotype. It, yeah, yeah, so that's what I'm using as the term character. Okay. I'm, I'm not talking about the DNA, I'm not talking okay. about the sequence, I'm just talking about the characteristics that you see okay. from people, tallness, shortness, mm -hmm. all the phenotypes. Um, so these are the characters or attributes or phenotypes that are residing on different chromosomes, some reside close to each other, so they're linearly arranged and that was the contribution that was made by Morgan and colleagues to say that these are the things which linearly reside on the chromosome and hence move around in a specific way. Now, this, all these things, Mendel was now dead for a long time and these are, and he had published this in late 19th century, um, but this was not seen by anybody. It was only Morgan and his experiments that brought back Mendel's work and showed for the first time that what he was saying was right and what he had done in span of 30 years of his uh, research career could be shown within weeks in flies mm. uh, with much less effort and much more rigor as to say. So what I have said so far and not I, some, some kids also told me the reason flies became an organism of choice is because uh, they have much faster life cycle they are cheap to grow. They are also not pests, by the way. Many of the insects that we see, like if you want to work on mosquitoes or other kind of fruit flies, they may be pests or vector of a disease, which we don't want when we are using it as modern organisms. So that was one thing. And the other thing why it became such a huge success was also because the community, the researchers who worked on flies were extremely generous. They shared their resources all the time. And that's why it became a mod, uh, model of no choice. So uh, you will see in these vials, but I just want to quickly tell you how their life cycle is. So after maybe a female gives rise to an egg, this egg then uh, comes, I mean, it hatches into a larva, and the larva goes and digs into the food, whichever, like banana or um, any rice. So it's, it's, it's only, so its source of food is yeast and not the food itself. And it digs and keeps eating, keeps eating till it becomes uh, the right size, uh, big enough. And then it climbs on the walls um, or climbs out of the food and then pupates it. So it becomes a pupa and then it stays as pupa. A lot of things are happening inside the body but it's constantly at one place and then it comes out as a fly. So that's the, that's the thing. Um, so another very interesting thing why it became such a uh, great model organism was also because you could keep, you know, in this room you can keep much, much more than a uh, population of Bangalore. So you can do all these population studies just by working on these guys. So the second part of this thing is that while 
uh, Morgan was working on the genetics and uh, chromosomal basis of how the genes move around from different generations. So he had left the, the thing of evolution which he started with anyway, he started working on evolution uh, on genetics. But he also had wonderful colleagues. Um, so, although uh, it was uh, Morgan who received the Nobel Prize for this uh, seminal work that he did, uh, his students also went on to do very, very big things. And one of them also got a Nobel. Um, so, um, what, what, what did they do? So, then my next person that I want to talk about is Arun Muller. So this was the time, so right after, uh, around the time when uh, Morgan was doing these discoveries, uh, there were two very important things that happened. One was the World War, uh, the First World War, um, and, and within a couple of decades or so, the Second World War also, also happened. So from 1914 to 1945, we had two World Wars. And the second big, uh, pretty big war was war against cancer. So people did not know cancer was there, from time alone, but people did not know what caused it. The only solution to cancer at that time was actually you see a mask, you remove it surgically, you remove as much area as possible from around it, and then go for the test. Uh, there was a lot of lethality because of that, mortality because of that, and um, and um, and there was no solutions, no mechanisms known why this was happening, and so there was this war against cancer where people were trying to get more and more money um, siphoned into cancer research. Um, so this was the time when for the first time, Herman Muller, who was actually a um, uh, modern student, showed that mutations are actually caused by x-rays and chemicals. So chemicals and x-rays can cause mutations which can change the characters or these attributes or these two types. So two things, very important things happened over that. One is that you came to know that why these mutations are caused. Yeah. So you can basically screen for different things. What kind of chemicals can cause mutations, uh, x-rays, nuclear uh, material can cause mutations. And then mutations meant that you can change the characters or change the attributes. And the second thing which actually became very important for the basic biologist or fundamental biologist is that we no longer depended on depended on going to the nature and then collecting all these white type flies and curling flies because still now Morgan was just collecting these flies, right? He could not make them himself. So this was the first time when they were able to make these flies themselves. So they can mutagenize flies. Okay. So then the question is that <coughs> what were we able to do by these mutations? Okay. So if you want to discover something, if you don't know how your eyes work, right? You close your eyes, you can't see anything. You open your eyes, you can see something. There are people who can't see even from very early on in their life. Some people become blind much later in their life. You want to know what is the genetic basis of this. So how do you do that? Any any ideas? How you can know? How, how do I become blind? I mean, these are the questions which people were asking at that time, and even now we ask these questions. Why, why you become blind? Why some people can't smell, they can't smell anything. Some people can smell something and not the other. Um, some people cannot walk, some have muscle problems, some have bone problems, all these things. So those were the times when we did not know what, what is there any genetic basis of it. But because of Muller's work, we decided or scientists decided that there should be genetic basis to everything. So what they started to do was something called forward genetic screens. Okay, so anybody knows what screen means? Screening? When you have to screen something? For example, if you want to hire somebody to take care of your pet, uh, what do you do? You put an advertisement and a lot of people apply for it and a lot of applications. And what do you do? You screen through it. Right? Screening means you, you're looking through different applications to find the one right person that you want. Genetic screens are similar. What you do is you get these thousands, hundreds, thousands of Flies, which you have generated yourself by mutagenizing, by x-rays, or by giving them some chemicals, and you have all these mutant flies. Okay. Now you want to know that what causes blindness in flies, and we know by uh, Darwin's work that whatever you find will have some uh, resonance to what uh, to our genetics as well. 
So what people did was they would, what you do if you want to know whether somebody is lying or not? If you want, so I mean, imagine that there is a person sitting next to you. How do you know whether she is blind or not? Hmm? What do you do? You check. Yeah, you just do this, right? Or you just put some light from one side and, and the person, if they want to be in light and not in darkness, they just walk towards that side, right? So that's what you do when you are looking at um, an F lines. So the flies are photo flies are phototropic, so they would like to go toward the light. Okay, so you take this kind of light, you know, and then you take some flies here and hundred thousand flies, not one or two. You take a lot of flies, and all of them will go toward the light. Okay, there will be let's say hundred remaining. Okay, hundred flies just won't go towards light. So what what are those hundred flies? They're blind. Are you sure about that? They don't want to go. Okay. The other options? They just fly. No, if they just don't want to go, they're one, at one place. Huh? Maybe they don't have eyes? Maybe they don't have eyes, but that also means that they're blind. Right? So if they don't have eyes, but what about they don't have legs? Right? If they don't have legs also, they will not go. And what if they have some muscle problem? What if they're sleeping? If you ask, if somebody asks you to go to some place at 2 o'clock in the night and you said, yes, yes, I'll go, and then you didn't turn up, what should people think? Yes. You were sleeping, right? So there are all sorts of things why one fly would not go there, right? So you take these 100 flies and you try again, maybe later, maybe after 3 hours, maybe they will go. Huh? Same set of flies. So you have removed the flies that went because those are not the flies you are interested in at all. But you have these hundred flies and they would be blind. But you have to make sure. You, I mean, if you get a message from somewhere, right, on WhatsApp and somebody says that, um, you know, some good, something happened there, what do you do? You don't believe, right? You just check on Google, you check on different places. Is this actually a true thing? So same way, as a scientist, you don't do that. You take these hundred flies and then you, uh, and then you check again. Check again, three times, four times. Now, you found that 20 of those flies actually bent. They just were not even moved toward that thing. Here are 80 flies. Then you check whether these flies can move. Okay? So they may have some other defect or not, not just visual defect. They may have brain defect. Then they don't, they just don't move. They have muscle defects, so they can't move. So there can be so many reasons why the flies cannot move. And finally, after testing so many things, you found that there are 50 flies that definitely are only affect, affected by the visual cue. So those are the 50 genes, possible 50 genes that may have an effect on visual transduction. So that's how most of the early discoveries of why you have all these different kinds of defects were made. And we go through one of these discoveries which is about body patterning. So, everybody knows that our body has certain patterns. We have left-right symmetry. So, we have everything that's on the left side is also there on the right side. At least as you are looking, when you are just looking at a person, right? And then we have top to bottom asymmetry. Which means that we have the same things like two eyes, part of the nose, ear, hand, legs. Exactly the same from left to right. But, we have head on the top. Then we have the body, and then we have legs, right? We don't have ulta ulta. We don't have like something different, right? And um, and so people are interested to know why we have that, right? Why we we all start with a single cell. We all, when we begin our lives in our mama's tummies, we all start with a very just one single egg, cell. Now, how do they become human? Right? We, we have this all symmetry, asymmetry, all these things happen. And that is true for most of the organisms. As you just saw in the fly, it also has a left right uh, symmetry and top to bottom asymmetry. So scientists wanted to do that, and that's how they started to work on the Drosophila larvae. So they did the mutagenesis, which I just told you. They just fed these plants with x ray, x ray, x ray. They put the mutations in the body, and then they looked whether you can find any differences 
and they found a lot of different larvae which did not look like this larva. So this is the normal larva, this is how it should be. And then you see that there are different kinds of larvae that you have to be seen here. And um, during with these experiments, what they found was that we as humans and the flies have exactly the same set of genes that are called Hox genes, which are present in the same pattern in humans and in flies, in the same uh, sequence also. So you see the pink box for human and flies is the same, then followed by orange box. Then humans have a yellow box which flies don't. But then you have this check box, and then you have this purple box, and blue box, and then green, and so on. So you have exactly the same structure for humans and flies. And what happens if we have mutations in any of these boxes? So these are called homeobox genes or box genes. And what happens if there is a uh, mutation? So this is how the normal fly should look like. And if you don't have, if you have repeat of one of the genes called ultraviolets, you'll have four sets of kids instead of two sets. To two wings, instead of two wings, you will have four wings. And if you don't have it, the same gene ultraviolet, if you don't have it, then you have no wings at all. Okay? And there is another uh, gene in the same cluster, in the box gene cluster, which is called uh, antenna where you have instead of antenna, if you express uh, that antenna media gene here, instead of antenna, you start getting wings. Okay, so this is exactly the same as what we see in some of the humans, the box gene, where you see polydactyly, for example. And it's, it's, it's exactly the same gene that uh, that causes uh, double wing sea flies. And the mutations you see that you have double the number of heads or eyes or uh, anything. So um, these are the three scientists, Lewis, Kristen, Bernard, and Michaud who did this, who made this discovery that our box genes and the fly box genes are exactly the same and how important role that they have for, um, for this. So um, what we have what we have seen so far is that, um, so these are all the Nobel laureates who have won Nobel prizes for their discoveries using the Sotila as a model organism. We've already talked about Morgan's work, we've talked about Gunnar's work which was X-ray and mutation. And these three people who got a uh, Nobel Prize for their work on Fox chain and how the uh, patterning body plans are made and how the patterning happens. Um, the lower ones, I did very briefly talk, tell them about their tell you about their work, although we will not go into that much detail. Uh, so Richard Axel uh, won the Nobel Prize for his work on flies and mice to understand the mechanism of smell or fashion, so how the smell works, and then Hoffman got the Nobel Prize for his work on innate immunity, so how we, how our immune system works. And very recently, in 2017, Paul Rosbash and Young got their uh, Nobel Prize for circadian rhythms. Now, we have to always bear in mind that these are the genes that they have discovered are true for across every species that we know. And, so, and that's why their work becomes so powerful. Um, so now we know about, uh, we, we, we have sequenced genomes and we have sequenced genomes for different um, uh, different organisms. What we know now that flies and uh, humans, uh, the difference between the number of genes is not a lot. So we, humans just have double the number of genes. 70% of human disease genes are present in flies. And many of them show the phenotypes or the attributes that we see uh, in, uh, in humans can be reproduced in flies. Uh, although their genome size is much smaller, so 23 times smaller, uh, while they have still 13,000 genes. So <coughs> the reason why human genome is so big as compared to flies is because each gene we have is uh, flies have is represented many times in humans. So there is a lot of redundancy. So for example, if you were looking at one gene that causes Alzheimer's or anything like which is important for skin color or anything, um, th those genes are present many times in humans. Like there, there will be like five or six genes for the same thing, while in flies there is only one. That is an advantage for a researcher because if you remove that gene, you can already see the changes. 
for humans, you have to, uh, I mean, you do not work on humans, but you know, other higher organisms, you have to remove all these three or four uh, genes, all of them to see the phenotype. So that is the thing. So not only at the genomic level, but we also have uh, similarities between human and flies. So patterning, which is talked about in asymmetry, but we also have similar digestive tracts, nervous system, circulatory system, etc. Et uh, I'll show you something. Uh, and can somebody tell between among kids what does it think is happening? Yeah. So maybe the blood circulation is happening. Exactly. Yes. Wow. So this is yeah. So the blood is getting circulated. They have a rudimentary heart, right? And uh, so so uh, many of the heart diseases can actually be studied in these flies. Okay. Um, so the second thing which I also want to just just uh, elaborate a bit on complexity which we deal with if we are not working on if we are working on different organs uh, on, on humans. So this is the human cortex. Human cortex is part of brain which is important for all the voluntary things that we do. Okay. So voluntary things. What are the voluntary things that you do? Sports. Yes, sports. So learning or the learning and memory things. Those are all happening in the cortex. And the cortex is the section of cortex, and as you can see, is that these dark spots are all the cells, neurons, and all these other uh, line, lines that you see, they are all the connection of these uh, cells or nervous cells or neurons they are called, they are making with each other. Now, if you wanted to know what happens if I remove this neuron, would you be able to do it in this, this complex structure? Because you don't even know where it is getting connected. One neuron is giving signal to many neurons. Okay. And that's how, excuse me, that's how our brain works. Okay. So we want to know, if we want to know if we remove one neuron or if we remove one connection, what would happen? It will not be possible to do in such a complex structure because this is such a plastic thing. You will never have the same kind of connection for every all of us for all of us anyway. So if I want to compare your brain to your brain, I will never be able to compare because they are so different, right? Um, but when we start working with flies, what you see is that there is a, this is, this and this are similar kind of structures. That's a, this is in flies, that's in people. That, that one is also a glutamatergic synapse, where what, what I mean by that is that uh, in synapses are the structures where two neurons or neuron muscles are connecting. And one neuron gives signal to the, so within the neuron the signals are electric. And between two neurons, the connections are two chemicals. So this, uh, this neuron spits some chemical on the other neuron. This you know, recognizes it and then uh, then gives out the signal. So it's the similar in the flies where you have these neurons where this neuron will go and make the connection here, there will be this connection here, and so on. And we know that we have. Uh, you can reproducibly look at different different flies and it will be exactly the same. So these are large, larger neuromuscular junction and you can easily see that this is a fly which has seizures. This fly gets seizures. We have some of them there and we will have a look at them. So these seizure flies, as you can see, they have much more number of synapses as compared to the other one. And uh, these, these uh, are used for uh, studying epilepsy. So these are the two flies. If you can see that one of them, one of them is epileptic. You shake it, which you can also do here, and then those epileptic flies will just fall down while normal flies they keep moving. And you see they have these tremors, um, and they are not able to get up at all. So what you can do with these kind of flies is that you can test drugs on them. And see whether we can improve this this at all. Um, it's going to die. It's not going to die. It will take its time, and uh, it will take some time to get up. That's all. Uh, just out of curiosity, now, how did you go around searching specifically for epileptic flies and collecting them? Yeah. How did you produce epilepsy with that? So we know that neurons have these electric connections. Yeah, and electric uh, channels, so there are sodium channels and potassium channels which are present on the neurons. And we know that um, 
all these epilepsy and seizures happen because there is a, too much of activity. So many of these sodium channels, when they are always open, that's what causes epilepsy. And mutations in these sodium channels or potassium channels causes epilepsy. epilepsy. So currently the way we do research is, and that's where we come into picture, is we create these mutations very specifically. We can also um, find if a uh, cohort human uh, in humans, if you see that this is a mutation, we can actually reproduce the same mutation in the flies to study the, their behavior. So that's the current way of doing it. But when I mean during the using the so that's called reverse genetics. But the forward genetic screens that I just talked about. There, what you do is you do test all of them. You mutagenize and test all of them. Whichever is not coming up quickly, you collect them, and that's how you find out what is causing. Uh, uh, I want to just talk about it. There are, there are lots of behaviors, complex behaviors that can be studied using flies, which include alcoholism, courtship, aggression, stress, learning, and memory. Many of these studies are being done within our institute also. And uh, the other thing which I wanted to uh, tell about is not just that you can do studies on the genes that are already present in the flies, which I just said that 70% of human disease genes are present in the flies, but there are genes which are present only in the humans and not in flies. So you can still study them in flies. One example is this A beta 42, which is important for Alzheimer's disease, which does not have a flies do not have. But what you can do is you can overexpress that gene in flies and see whether it has any effect. So here this gene A beta 42 is being expressed only in the eyes of the fly. And you see that the eyes become instead of looking like this, they start to be looking very uh, uh, a lot of cells are dying. And then what you can do is you can do studies to see how can I improve it. So within whether other fly gene mutations can improve this, and that's what is, is being done here, and that's that's how uh, the targeted drug discoveries are done. These are the, also the first organisms to travel in space because uh, the new study uh, effects of zero gravity on generations of flies because you can keep them for such a long time. Uh, also, different parameters how they respond, uh, the flies respond to them. Um, and then these are the broad areas of research that we do in India using flies. There are more than 200 fly labs in India. So, some of the, I think it's written there what it means. One, so the, okay, so the other thing which I wanted to say there are two flies. One is saying band sensitive, and the other is, so this is just eye color. Right? That's the eye color. So there is other one yeah. which is Bank called Bank sensor. Bank sensor. Yeah. Yeah. Temperature, sensitive. temperature sensitive. Yes. So temperature sensitive flies, what you can do is, so they at high temperature they just leave. They are temperature sensitive. So what you can do is take the wire and do this, and you'll see that. Yes. See, she has done that, and her flies are sleeping now. So interestingly, okay, this is Shibiri, uh, but interestingly, the same gene can actually be mutated either to become epileptic or to become uh, uh, paralytic. So we have the uh, same gene, which is sodium channel mutation. Can be can if there is a mutation that closes the channel, it becomes paralytic. If it opens the channel, it becomes epileptic. So it's, it's the mutation of the same gene. So we did not bring the paralytic flies, but these shibiri and sensitive are also paralytic. They are paralyzed just because you have kept them. What happens to bank sensitive? Bank sensitive should be banned. So you just bang it like this, and then yeah, exactly. Um, and then um, they should find it difficult to get out. So these are uh, I mean, we are saving seventy percent. Yes. Yeah. Oh, as they are sensitive with the pen or whatever. Yes. So we so so 
temperature sensitive part is actually specifically brown. Um, but the same gene that makes this one's temperature sensitive, which is the gene called Shibiri, uh, is present in us. And uh, we uh, loss of Shibiri, I mean, we don't have loss of Shibiri because if there's no Shibiri, we will not even be born. But some mutation in Shibiri can have brain disorders. Because it's, it's present in the bronze and it's important for uh, uh, So these can have So the temperature sensitive part is just an allele or just a mutation that, that's useful for a researcher and then we make them because you can see if if this is if you mutate Shibiri, then this fly will not exist. But we want to work on this fly and know what she really does. Right? So we make these mutants which make it temperature sensitive. We keep growing it in low temperature where it functions as normal gene. But then when we want to actually do the experiment, we increase the temperature. So that it now starts behaving like a mutant. So it's a it's we, so, so keeping temperature sensitive alleles of different genes is very useful for us. So uh, that, that, that's the reason why this is temperature sensitive. It's nothing to do with you know uh, the function. Okay, what sort of uh, kind of mutagens What kind of mutagens that we use? Okay, so um, currently we don't do mutagenesis like this. this these kind of mutagenesis are called random mutagenesis. Because during, I mean, until very recently, uh, targeted mutagenesis was not possible. Um, so what we, what people did, and I mean, during my PhD times, I have also done something like this, but now it's not required, which is just to make them eat some mutagens, and then um, in the next generation, look at their behavior or whatever phenotype you are interested in eating. Um, now what we do is, we do very, very targeted mutagenesis, just because there are tools now to do them, right? So uh, what we do, for example, is that we, so there is, uh, I don't know if you, you know about this or not, but these are very recent tools called CRISPR-Cas9 based genome engineering. That's what we do now, is we, we look at the sequence, this is the sequence we want to remove and uh, we make the uh, constructs for it and then we do it. That's what we do. How long this week for? So, <laughs> um, I think they're dead now. Uh, but but if, you, if, if you just keep it for some time and then they will come up. Uh, this one definitely looks like. Yeah. But then you. Look at that huh? Look at that Ah, so you can actually keep them and see whether, but if you just keep them, I mean, uh, So they are so temperature sensitive that they die. Yeah, it looks like that. Um, yeah. So what happens to sensitive people? <laughs> yeah, so, so you have to keep them for very short time and not at this time. So we, when we work on them, we work at 29 degrees. So at 25 they are surviving, at 29 they are uh, sleeping. But here when you do that, at 37 they are going to be we uh, hear more about mines being used in laboratories for experimentation, but you said this is like 70% yeah. I'm just wondering, is that even more? That yes, yes, okay. yes. So they, so the very, um, so what I did, said was that 70% of human disease genes are represented in flies. Now, what it means is that if human has a Shibiri gene, fly also has a Shibiri gene. That's what it means. How much their sequences are similar, that is, that always depends on whether you're looking at, as you go to higher and higher organisms, the sequence similarity will start getting much, 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 much more. So it's also possible that uh, mice may also have, let's say, 70% similarity of, I mean, representation, as I said, but the actual sequence will be very similar. So that's what it means. The other thing with, between higher, when we are comparing higher organism versus the lower organisms as, as the flies, is that the control, the regulation in us and in higher organisms is much, much stronger. 
That's why we have like four or five genes for just one thing. So that if one of them is not working, still we can, you know, manage. Uh, fly on the other hand, if one is not there, it's it's not there. It's, it's there. Um, so that's that's the thing about. Uh, I mean, you. So what I mean by that is that mice may have. So human has let's say six genes controlling one activity, mice had four genes controlling the same activity and fly has one. Uh, but when you compare, you will say that this disease is represented in flies because it's, there is a gene for it. Yeah. Yeah. Can we induce tumor in flies? And yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How can we induce it? Um, so tumor induction is either done by genetics, which is you, you find one of these P53. I mean, there are several genes yeah. which are important, notch and one. Like basically, we do it on rats right now. Uh -huh. We did basically on the thighs. Uh -huh. And we induced tumor there. Uh -huh. And we tried in flies, but we couldn't do it. Uh -huh. So that you would have to, you know, go, go and yeah. see which genes you would be like, would like to. I mean, the problem is, as I just said, is that if there is only one gene representing uh, uh, a phenomenon in the fly, what you need to do, I mean, if, if that, that gene is very important, what you need to do, and which I just showed in the previous slide, is that you mutagenize only in a tissue. You don't mutagenize in the whole body. If you do that, then the fly does not exist. It is there. So what you do then is you mutagenize in eye. Eye is a good system because in, even absence of eye is okay for the fly. It will not die. Uh, wings is a good system because even in the absence of wing, it will uh, survive. But heart is not a good system because if there's no heart, the fly. Will. I mean, as as you can compare it with us in that sense, that without vision we can survive, without a hand we can survive, etc., etc. So so that's how you decide. And eyes that. That's why it makes a good system and that's why for a Zymer study, eyes are used and not brain because if you don't have brain, the fly will not support. So you do these kind of studies, um, these kind of components. Same for uh, in the induction of cancer uh, or tumors, you can use a tissue like eyes and you see these tumors coming up and Huh? You tried on the wings. Oh, you were also being very specific. How, so, what, were you doing by genetics or? I'm a BSC student. Huh. So, yeah, I'm being joined in a group in IASC. Huh. And uh, like it's been a week that uh, started doing research works. There we did for mice. Huh. So, those teachers have told us to do on insects now. Huh. And okay. they gave us a uh, dose of pillar mice. Okay. They don't even culture them. Uh, we can maybe discuss this. Uh, you yeah. know. Uh, generally, whatever experiment we do in the work, I was thinking that most of my clients and graphics, they compare it to too much larger than that of she like that. For example, that's like this small size definitely poses a challenge. And how do you exactly you know, manipulate it, which is much easier than relatively in the yeah. body? So, most of the biochemistry experiments definitely are much easier in uh, bigger organisms like mice or that. But the genetics experiments are definitely much easier in flies. The reason is that if you wanted to study, let's, I mean, especially for random things, like if you want to study what causes, um, um, I didn't show one of the videos, very nice ones, where you can actually study um, uh, age related muscle softness or something. I mean, you know, things like which you don't. Uh, which can also have a genetic basis to it. Um, and you grow, you can grow these flies. I mean, mouse has a life cycle of two years, right? They, um, uh, flies survive till about two months. That's the maximum, usually by 45 days or so they are there. Um, so at, at one month, these flies are very old. So you can do these, the study of, you know, these kind of things within a month or two, with fraction of the money that you would spend on mice, you can do this. And then you can, I'm not saying that you stop it there. You Once you have figured some pathway, some molecular mechanism out in flies, then you bring in higher organisms, then you study them, which is 
the way to go about it because then you don't need to you can use 100,000 flies to come up to some conclusion then you have to use only 100 miles to to you know get to uh, the same conclusion or at least a much closer conclusion to humans so that's the that's the reason why we uh, study flies also what you were saying is that because they are so tiny and how do you uh, manipulate or i mean people do it i have done it uh, the only thing is that uh, you also look for simple things when you're doing it. Uh, so for example when you all those dissections that i showed of muscles uh, you which is very simple you just cut and then you put so those are the kind of experiments you actually end up doing uh, you do more of genetics it's a genetic experiment and then the actual looking at the phenotype they are they are usually simple they're usually simple things so you must be using a microscope for yes yeah all the making of transgenics we, we have micro manipulators we have yeah so if there are more questions we can take it outside also over tea yeah then if you want to conclude it